What if you could learn from physical product entrepreneurs that have risen up from the trenches to dominating their market by creating successful physical product brands? Well, this podcast is hosted by me, Kanoe Campbell, and it's about breaking the mold to becoming a smarter, savvier, and better product entrepreneur. You discover how to take physical products from concept through launch and to scaling up from physical product entrepreneurs who've taken their revolutionary ideas to 1 million, 10 million, and 50 million plus in revenue businesses. You'll also join me on my journey to build a million dollar physical product brand business in a year, where we both will learn about crowdfunding, selling to retail chains, launching through marketplaces like Amazon, strategic partnerships, publicity, celebrity endorsements, and selling direct to consumers. So if you're creating or building a brand in the consumer packaged goods space, in fashion and apparel, business products, or any physical product niche, listen in because we have you covered. Join the fast track to physical product business success. This is the Physical Product Business Podcast. I'm Kune Campbell. Let's get rolling. Hi guys, welcome to the Physical Product Business Podcast, part of the 2X e-commerce podcast. And today we're going to be talking about a brand called Slosa, right? Slosa. And um, I'll give you a bit of a background of the brand and I'll introduce the founder, very brilliant entrepreneur. Right. So Slosa is an all natural cabbage based um, spicy relish, which uniquely combines slaw or coleslaw in the UK with salsa and it's been stocked over in over like 8,000 restaurants in in the US, as well as in stadiums and restaurants. Um, Julie is the founder, Julie Boucher, and um, she's proudly 100 bootstrapped Slosa, and it's about five years old, and um, she's been honored one of 2015's top women in top women in grocery um by the progressive grosses and um she's been featured in several shows shows such as um the today show shark tank hungry girl and the food network without further ado i'd like to welcome julie boucher Hi. oh thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it you're welcome lovely surname by the way <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I've introduced you, but could you, in your own words, you know, um, introduce yourself and, 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 and your brand? Sure. So, Slosa is, in essence, a cabbage-based relish with heat undertones. We know relishes, and you guys probably know relishes as being primarily pickle-based, cucumber-based. Um, we are cabbage-based. So, it's healthier, more versatile, um, just more depth of flavor, just more uses uh, of it. Um, And we do have those salsa heat undertones to it as well. Um, So, you know, it's great on your hot dogs, brats, burgers, pulled pork, fish. You know, you can incorporate it like your egg potato tuna salad. Uh, I think uh, the British might know something close to it, like a piccalilli. Um, piccalilli, So it's it's kind of like that. We do have a little bit of a mustard um, vinegar base, but it's not really overwhelming. It's just... Something that's very unique to our grocery industry here, and I launched it five years ago. Again, 100% woman-owned and bootstrapped, and uh, very proud of how far we've gotten in the short amount of time that we've been able to do it so far. So. Fantastic, and it's you know it was a ride, it was a journey. It's been a journey so far, I, I would I would assume, because I I um, came across your Indiegogo um, campaign while doing some research prior to our interview. And there was so much passion. You'd a week before um, we're in Shack Tank, and with so much energy, you still you know launched um, an Indiegogo campaign. Um, so could you tell us about? Okay, before we go into to that, could you tell us a bit about um, the um, flavors you have? Um, how many kind of flavors do you have at the at the moment? So right now we have four primarily flavors, original, spicy, a garlic, and we've got a new kind of habanero fire. Okay. Um, the Americans, we love our hot stuff. So um, there's been a, a strong um, request from customers, hey, we want something really hot. Uh, so my, my personal favorite is a spicy. But in addition to our retail jars, we also have a food service half gallon size. So okay. um, we're in Hero Burgers up in Canada and we're in several stadiums. So um, it's nice to have a product that not only is great on the grocery store shelf, mm-hmm. but it's going to get used in much more communal activities, like your grilling and tailgating events here in America. So it's going to get shared a lot more. And the fact that we can use it in stadiums and in restaurants and that give trial to grow the awareness on the shelf is 
it really is a win-win. So right. So, yeah. so that versatility is important. So I think I've picked up on two things. One is the uniqueness. So there was nothing like slaughter in the market initially. Yeah. So it was a unique idea. And at the end, uh, and the second bit I've, I've sort of picked upon is the fact that um, it's not just restricted to cooking. You could use it in a stadium with burgers or hot dogs on there. You could learn, you could discover it at a barbecue, and then you could use it, you know, domestically in a, in a house. Is, 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 have, have those been the core pillars of your success or of creating awareness of, of, of slaughter? Yeah, um, so I think when you have a product that's unique as salsa, you have, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It takes time to kind of re-educate the public because the public only knows the relish as being a pickle base. Mm. And so you have to tell them, hey, this has half the sodium, 20% more vitamin C than a pickle relish. You have to get them to try it. You know, there is a lot of education. And the media has really helped with that. So when Hungry Girl talks about it, you know, and she's talking to her big fan base. That is huge for us. Or when we're featured on today's show or Shark Tank, um, so that um, that awareness is extremely helpful. But on the flip side, uh, retailers really like products that are more unique and things that they don't have. Um, because if I were to introduce another pickle relish, they've got a million pickle relishes already on the shelf, and why would they take out something that's already performing well to put to take a chance on something that they don't know how it's going to do? Mm -hmm. um, so it, when you launch a product, the more unique the product you have, the more ability you're going to have at getting a retailer to embrace it. Um, but again, you have a little bit of a harder go at educating the consumer because they don't necessarily know what to do with it, or they don't, you know, our relish is yellow. It's not green, so it just looks different. So um, we really have to have an extra hurdle in educating the consumer. Um, but again, it is it has been very much embraced by the major mainstream retailers here in the U.S. It, was it something you, was it a principle you, you, you sort of, no, was it was it something you 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 you're aware of at the start of founding Slosa, or, or did you discover that uniqueness was you know um, an advantage to, to to getting on the shelves of retail stores? Um, I, I definitely knew that we were unique in the very beginning. I didn't know it was going to be as much of an advantage um, in getting on the shelf. And really, that's where the work begins. A lot of startup food companies think, oh, if I can only get on the shelf, then it'll sell itself. Well, it doesn't sell itself. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that retailers are really looking at the, the more progressive retailers, there are some that are more the leaders and some that are the followers. And the leaders are the ones that they're really looking for diversifying um, their shelves. Okay. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. But I didn't know that in the beginning. That's kind of something I learned kind of as we got launched. Okay, okay. With regards to the education, when did you, how early on did you start to educate and create awareness of the uniqueness of, of Slosa? Um, I'm very media driven in terms of, uh, of trying to get people to try it. Um, when we got a few major retailers in one particular region of the country, I was able to do some syndicated radio. Uh, we are able to get product out to bloggers who are talking about it. Um, really, a lot of grassroots PR getting in regional magazines versus national ones. It's like, you know, everyone says, I want to get on Oprah. Um, but if you're only in 200 stores, getting on Oprah or a major television show like that is not going to do you any good because most of the country cannot immediately buy you at the grocery store they would have to order it which is a little bit more expensive online mm -hmm. um, if you're in four five six eight thousand stores and you're getting that media then people will pick you up when they see you in the store and then they know where to get you again and again and again that makes sense so, so it's do you think it's a chicken and egg situation or do you think retailers should work on distribution first uh before media you, like the food manufacturer um you know what, you only have about a year to prove yourself in any particular retailer, if, if, and sometimes it's only six months. If you're not showing sales right off the bat, then if another item comes along to swap you out with, a buyer will do that. 
Um, so you really have to, um, you have to get the distribution, but then as soon as that happens, you've got to really work hard and fast um, at, you know, getting, uh, getting awareness out and getting trial because um, y you have a short time on the shelf to prove yourself. And um, luckily, if you do have a more unique item, I think you've probably got a little bit more leniency uh, in terms of the, you know, the buyer wanting to give you a little bit more of a chance. But um, thankfully, a lot of our major retailers, we've been in for four years and, you know, we feel very comfortable um, in, in those stores. Uh, but it's a very high attrition industry. 80% of new product launches fail within two years. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it's even higher amongst a small food manufacturer because we don't have the millions of dollars to just dump into marketing. You know, the major manufacturers dominate the space because they dominate the ad spends on, on the, the circulars, on advertising, and they can immediately launch a product nationwide because they can buy the space on the shelf. The little guy like us, we can't do that. So we have to build it crappier. Right, 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 right. Okay, so let's, let's take our listeners or viewers back five years ago and kind of where, where were you? How did you get your initial distribution deal and potentially your, your, your media coverage? What, what, what steps did you take after you'd sort of decided that, okay, this version of Slosso is good enough to, for, for the market? Um, so I'll take you even a little bit farther back. Um, my history, uh, for over 10 years, I worked in sports marketing in the sport of NASCAR. Um, auto racing, uh, and if, I'm sure if you're watching Formula One, you know how big sponsorships are, and um, and my job within the sport uh, was to represent sponsors within the sport um, and kind of be their liaison between the team and to help them activate all their marketing sponsorships um, to connect to the fan. Uh, I also helped Bobby Labonte start his marketing agency. He was a champion driver in 2000. Uh, so. Thankfully, I had that marketing background, and also thankfully for nine and a half of those over 10 years, General Mills was a client of mine, a major food company here in the U.S. Okay. Um, so I think I absorbed some knowledge that I use today. Um, I, I really do think that had I not had that marketing background, it would have been a lot harder um, when it came to pitching the first retailer, I mean, we had our, you know, we had our means of production set up with a co-packer. We had, you know, obviously FDA compliant labels. And I mean, we were in essence ready to go. We were all in, in the U S the food industry is highly regulated. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of hurdle. It, it takes probably, it took me probably six months to prepare the company to be able to launch. From, um, from a regulation standpoint. Oh, um, yeah. And just, okay. just I mean, setting up the website and Facebook, just designing labels and everything that you have to do to be able to launch something. Um, and, and there are some uh, state um, testing that has to go on in terms of your pH level and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah. So, there was probably six months of solid work before we could launch. And then it was me just being brave enough to go into a buyer, you know, to set up a meeting with a buyer at a, uh, one of the major retailers based here in North Carolina where I live. Which one? Um, How it's did you Ingalls Markets. Um, they are based in Asheville, and they okay. have, they're a 200-store chain um, that covers about five states in the area. Okay. And I guess stupidly or bravely, I just set up a meeting with the buyer, and um, I think the one thing that really helped us was that a lot of companies, when they're starting out, they're saying, hey, taste this. This is so good. This is our product. It's, you know, they're going in with flavor as being the number one seller of their brand. Right. The buyer wants to see how you're going to market the brand because there are tons of fantastic products out there that taste excellent that will never go anywhere because they don't have the right marketing behind it. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, okay, we're going to do this many cents off promotions um, each year. That's going to encourage trial. We're going to do, you know, these sampling events. We're going to, um, you know, do uh, a syndicated radio station in the area. I'm going to be very aggressive at getting, 
you know, um, magazines and local TV news coverage and things like that to generate trial. So, so this is just external awareness on yeah. your budget. The, 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 the yeah. stores are not paying for that. They're only giving yeah. you that opportunity to reach right. out to their customers. Right. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. So I think you, when you present any product, food product or non-food product to a buyer, the product attributes are great and the flavor is great and the health attributes, that's fantastic to present to them. But first and foremost, you need to present a marketing plan that is going to prove to that buyer it's going to sell off the shelf. Um, or at least that you've got a good shot. Because, because they're, they're being measured as buyers yeah. on, on, on the sellability, on how fast, on the, the stock turnaround, the, the stock turnover of, of the products they buy, they stock in the, shel in, in the shelves of the stores. Right. Right. And and if it's not performing at a certain level and they've taken something off the shelf that was performing to put you on, that doesn't put the buyer in the good, um, you know, in a good spot with his boss. So, you know, they, they're, they're very hesitant to take on new products unless you can kind of prove to them, here's what I'm going to do and here's what's going to make it sell. Okay, gotcha. So how did that initial rollout go? Um, so six months after, how long did, how much, how many months did they give you? Um, to, to trial and um, what kind of marketing did you do to, 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 to gain results? Well, and another thing I think people don't understand in the grocery industry is when you meet with a buyer during his category review time, mm -hmm. they don't immediately put you in. He's got to wait until six months, eight months down the road mm -hmm. until, you know, the, I guess the category comes up for review because every product on the shelf has a space. And unless he does an immediate swap out of the exact same size product, it, he has to kind of redesign the whole planogram. Um, it's kind of like the map mm -hmm. on, on the shelf in the category. And your buyer not only could be reviewing your category, but he's in charge of 10 other categories. And um, a lot of times when you approach a buyer to set up a meeting, you say, hey, when are you reviewing the relish category again? Because okay. I want to meet up with you. You have to understand they could be in the middle of reviewing three other categories now. and They don't have time to look at something in the relish category until it's his time or her time of the year to do so. so I think so, that's a really key point with regards yeah. to, you know, speaking their language, you know, the, right. and, you know, m making reference to the planogram and when they're going to review the category yeah. you're, you're looking yeah. to. Yeah. I think a lot of people who have products right. just think it, it's going to happen immediately. In the grocery industry, especially, we are such a slow moving entity. Um, you really have to be cognizant of calendar dates and, mm -hmm. and communicating in a very um, professional manner with the buyer and being respectful of his or her time. Mm -hmm. so, so, what kind of timeline did he? Or did she give you? Uh, I, I want to say on that one, I met with him during the summer. And then it was probably around late October, early November that the first PO came in. And then it took probably another month to get into those stores. Um, at the same time, I'm meeting with other retailers. And our second retailer was able to, it, and it's very rare for the relish category for us to get in before the holidays because that's not the beginning of the relish season. Mm. Spring is a much more reasonable reset time. Um, so they review categories in the fall, winter, and then they'll reset in the spring. Um, and every retailer is different. So <laughs> you can't count on that for every retailer. So you have to constantly reach out to them. So the second retailer was a a little bit over a hundred store chain, Food City. Um, they're based in uh, Tennessee um, and or Abington, Virginia, which is on the border of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I believe that I met with them in maybe September, so maybe just a few months after I met with Ingalls. But I couldn't get in until March. Wow! Um, okay. They were able to put us in, but six um, months. Yeah, it was yeah. six months. And some, I'll tell you. There is one retailer that took us over a year to get in from the time they gave us the commitment during our meeting because they were, I think it was even over a year because they were going through a buyout with another retailer and things just got delayed and they just didn't make any changes for a while. So, uh, yeah, it's, 
it's a frustrating industry. <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot of waiting involved. So how, it is. Yeah. So how do you so? What, how do, what do you do with the time with the waiting time? Do 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 you fill that up with marketing? Um, because there the are only so so many meetings you you're ever going to have um, to 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 with initial meetings you're going to have with the buyers. So what what did you do? between you know those spaces of time say september to the december when you are not pitching to other buyers right um you know what i think um you are constantly um trying to set up media contacts to get media for the spring so like right now in the u.s all the major magazines are coming out with their 2017 editorial calendars mm. um so that comes out between october november I will print all of those off for every publication that I think appeals to us. Like, we've been in Rachel Ray's magazine twice. Um, so, if something in their editorial calendar hits the checkbox for Slalsa, I know to reach out to them four to six months in advance of that. Okay. How, how, how do you get hold of their editorial calendar? You know what? You can just find those online for free. So, you can type in um, the name of the magazine. And then 2017 editorial calendar or 2017 media kit, and that will come up for advertisers. And the editorial calendar will usually be within that media kit. That's a um, super so, tip. Yeah, yeah, great. Right. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, so, um, so, so it probably almost took you one year to to get onto the shelves. Is is that about right? That's or? probably right for the. Mm-hmm the immediate and like we've got retailers now that we know like uh, Safeway out west we know we're in those stores we're waiting on category resets to happen okay. so you know sometimes um, you know sometimes you're meeting with the retailer and you're getting a commitment early you know months many months before you actually get on the shelf so okay. um, you're constantly planning ahead for what you can prepare for so by the time you get on the shelf you can hit the road running with marketing it's fascinating stuff really really fascinating okay so you you got onto the shelves um one year on what was the initial feedback you you got from a sales standpoint how did you come up with the requirements of the stores because um they'd obviously have minimum order quantities um in their po that have you know ordered a certain number of quantities how did you you're fully bootstrapped how did you sort of make up with just make up to their demands really uh, meet their demands yeah so um the one thing when you're negotiating with a buyer you can set your own minimum orders uh so um i have a minimum of just say a pallet and that can be split up amongst flavors that's kind of my minimum order mm-hmm. um some retailers i'll give a little bit of a price break if they order two pallets at a time I'm very, very fortunate that we have a product with a very long shelf life, um, 18 months. So I can do that a little bit easier than people who have more perishable items. I will tell you, if you have an item in the frozen or refrigerated space or something that's highly perishable like in baking or deli, it's going to be a much harder road for you um, because um, you're going to have to factor in the fact that retailers will need higher margins um, in those specific areas because of the cost to refrigerate or the fact that some of your products just going to go out of date before it can sell. Um, And then, um, yeah, those items, those areas are very, very difficult. In the frozen space, I don't know of a retailer that, that would not require you to pay a slotting fee um, just to get in, and those can be very expensive. So um, I think when you look at the products that have been on Shark Tank on ABC Shark Tank, do you guys watch it over there? Well, we have our some of us do, but we have our version called Dragon's Den. Okay, okay. so perfect. So okay. Dragon's Den, exact same thing. Same format. Same, same thing. Say half of the CPG grocery food companies that have been on Shark Tank are already out of business, and the half. primary reason for that, some of them. Um, some of them have had recalls. They didn't know they had a, have a traceability program, and they, I guess, weren't properly insured. Or um, a lot of them are in that frozen or perishable space, and it was just too tough of a road and too expensive of a road to get distribution, and so they kind of fizzled out. We were very fortunate that by the time I went onto the show, we were already in forty two hundred stores when I pitched. Um, including Kroger and Walmart and some other major ones. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, I was able, even though we aired in the winter time, which was not ideal for us, um, we were able to get a little bit more traction um, because we already had significant did, sore presence. Did, did, did sales <laughs> double? So, sorry, you're uh -huh. saying... <laughs> No, they didn't. Um, in fact, I've probably gotten more out of Hungry Girl um, than I've gotten out of Shark Tank. Right. Um, with Shark Tank, you have to have an overwhelming flavor edit. And even though I didn't get a bad flavor edit, I just didn't get that overwhelming flavor edit. Lori, one of the sharks, when I pitched to her for about an hour, she got up several times and she ate off of several other shark plates. I mean, she loved it so much, <laughs> but they didn't show that in the airing. Oh, so, what a shame. So even though she says, I love the product, and Mark said, you know, I'll be a customer for life, they didn't really show them really enjoying it as much as they do in other edited food segments. So I'll, I was kind of bummed that I didn't get the flavor segment that I felt like we deserved. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't there. So you're at the so, mercy of the producer, really. <laughs> he, they, they just cut and show whatever they want to show, really. Oh, yeah. it's, it is, which is interesting. Okay, so... Um, how did you kind of climb up the media pyramid or the media ladder? You know, getting to, onto today's program or um, on, on today's show, sorry, or, or um, Shark Tank is by no means, you know, an easy feat. So what was your strategy? Do you, do you hire a, a media rep or do you do all the PR yourself? I do the PR myself. I have hired media reps in the past uh, PR agencies. I feel like I've paid... Uh, monthly fees and I've gotten no results. Um, I get much more results on my own, but I do have a marketing background. I'll tell you a quick little story on how the Today Show happened. Um, and we're going to have a Fox and Friends coming up for Super Bowl. Um, so we've got, we've got more on the horizon. But the, the Today Show happened because I think when I'm working, I will keep the televisions on in the background, very low volume, um, so I can hear what's happening within the news. Mm. So some mornings, it could be Today Show, Fox and Friends, Good Morning America. If something catches my ear, yep. I will act on it. Um, so I remember hearing, and this was probably back in June, Dylan Dreyer, who is um, on the 9 o'clock hour of the Today Show, She there, there was a study that came out that um, the Today Show cast was talking about um, the healthiest and least healthiest condiments. Of course, least healthy being mayo and ranch dressing and, and healthy being mustard. And, and they went around the table saying, what is your favorite condiment? And Dylan said, she said, I know you guys are going to think I'm weird, but I really love relishes. And I immediately thought, okay, <laughs> Dylan is my girl. So I sent her an email about an hour after she got off of air. And it was very short and brief. And I think I had a really creative subject line that said, I've got a relish you will relish, or something like that. Okay, and it was, just a few, it was just a few sentences. I said, hey, you're going to be getting a package on Friday. Um, heard you love relishes. You will think this is the most awesome product in the world, or something like that. And I wrote it, I, gave, I sent her a case, wrote a handwritten note, um, reminded her that National Hot Dog Day was coming up in July. Um, sent it off, never heard a thing. And then on National Hot Dog Day, um, they were doing another segment during the 9 o'clock, the kickoff to the 9 o'clock hour of the Today Show. And she says, okay, I just have to give a shout out here. She lifted up a jar on air and started gushing about it. So, and then Al Roker and Natalie Morales, they started eating it and loving it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. <laughs> so, um, it, was, there for you. it was. It all came about because I was listening what happens in the news. So literally, exactly. Whether literally. You know, it's Rachel Ray show, Doctor Oz, the doctors, all the sh any show that I feel like, hey, there is a connection to salsa because of the health attributes or whatever it is. Um, so I am constantly, you know, keeping my ear open and trying to act on whatever i hear and there's so many sort of subcategories you could reach out to it's it's also uh, from the oh. from your product description you're fat free gluten free low in sodium vegan kosher cholesterol free and all natural so there's so many sort of sub points or you know kind of like subtopics you could you could um hit on yeah and something yeah. else that i um i've been actually following the last several years is there is a cancer study 
funded by the American Institute for Cancer Research. It's been happening at University of Alabama, Birmingham for several years now. And it's regarding sulforaphane, which is a compound found within cruciferous vegetables like cabbage, mm. um, and its impact on cancer. Um, so the results are just now coming out in publications. Um, so Dr. Collis Ball has said, Julie, you can help announce the news. So now I'm reaching out to all of the health um, contrib uh, contributors and the, the health shows like Dr. Oz and the doctors to let them know, hey, this new study is coming out and here's the reasons why people should be eating more cabbage. And oh, by the way, I turned a head of cabbage, a million dollar idea. So, you know, I, you know, um, I'm try working on getting that out because the, um, the results of that study should have a great deal of impact on pregnant women, mm -hmm. um, eating more cruciferous vegetables, uh, as well as just feeding them to your kids at a higher rate, the younger they are, it will help, um, ward off certain cancers. That's fascinating. When, yeah. when are you due to, to make the announcement? I'm sorry? When are you due to make the announcement? Um, you know what? They've already started publishing the results. So I think two media or two medical journals have already started publishing it. So I'm I'm trying to see if I can hook a big guy into announcing it now that the, the uh, findings have been officially published. I think they don't want to announce it too early. Um, so hopefully, you know, in the next couple months, we'll start to hear about it. And if we can help out with that, you know, that's going to help us out being a cabbage-based relish. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. So, um, you launched five years ago. We're now in 2016. If you were to do it again, do you think the landscape has changed from a product launch standpoint? Do you think we have a lot more options or um, do you think it's pretty much the same principles that apply um, five years back? You know what? I, I don't think it's changed too much in five years. I think in 10 years, it's changed. The grocery landscape has changed a lot. Um, there are probably a few things that I would do differently. Initially, I only started off with the one flavor, original. I probably would have attempted to launch two flavors initially because if you can get two facings sitting next to each other, they're going to pop off the shelf. One tends to get lost a little bit. Mm. So if you can um, if you can do two or three of an item, at the same time, you don't want to launch too many products at the same time because the demand is not going to be there. Um, and you can find yourself um, with a big inventory issue uh, and not selling through fast enough of certain flavors. Um, so uh, I, I think if I had to do it all over again, I would have started out with definitely at least two or three flavors. Um, and then built on from there. Going you're, forward, you're, you're four flavors at the moment. We are four, we are four now, um, and I'm looking at launching a secondary line. Another unique condiment, but different from salsa. Totally. Oh, well, interesting. Would it have the same brand name, or are you going no, to... No, it'll have a different brand name. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> and I trust it'll be as inventive as it is, because... It will be. It seems it will. like you, you're good at words. <laughs> <laughs> you have a thing at words. Okay. Right. Okay, so I, I think... That will. Do you have any other tips to, you know, product entrepreneurs looking to what would be the first if, if they were to have a checklist to launch to retail outlets? What would the checklist look like? OK, um, I think first and foremost, if you are launching a food product, uh, your best resource is your state department of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Because they've got a lot of free programs and education workshops, and there is so much to learn within the grocery industry. You can make a few very expensive mistakes early on that will really cripple your ability to grow um, by partnering with the wrong brokers or the wrong um, distributors. Um, there are better ways of approaching certain retailers than others, and it's just something that you really need an experienced group to help you with that. Your State Department of Agriculture, is, or our state, North Carolina, is extremely helpful at trying to get people off on the best foot um, from the very beginning. And they're going to help you with all of the governmental requirements of launching a food product as well. Okay. Um, uh, so that would be for a food product. Definitely start with them. With any entrepreneur, I think, and especially in the grocery industry, it's so important to find someone 
in your industry, not necessarily the exact same product, but like for me, if I found someone who was five to seven years ahead of me who maybe launched a tomato sauce or something like that and asked that they would be your mentor um, because they are going to, I'm telling you, they will save you tens of thousands of dollars just by doing a brain, a one hour brain dump once a quarter or something because you're going to have a ton of questions as you go. And if you're learning mistakes, learning by making mistakes as you go, you can find yourself in a horrible financial situation. So find a mentor, someone in a, a similar category, but non-competitor because they'll want to help you out. And I've always found, and I mentor about a dozen companies myself. Um, I've always found that other food businesses want to help someone else get started. Mm. I've never found, um, no, you know, your competition or something like that. If you're not in the competing category, I'll tell you, you will get more information from them on the do's and the don'ts than anything. So find a mentor within your industry, not the upper echelons of corporations, not the CEO or the president of a major corporation, because they have probably never launched a product from infancy. Absolutely. They have their budgets. And who has really done the exact same thing that you're doing, who might be five years, seven years ahead of you, and you're going to get more knowledge than it'll blow your mind. It really gotcha. will. Gotcha, gotcha, and um, yeah. So you you run a Facebook group, right, with, with entrepreneurs? You, you did mention it. What's yes. It, what's the name of your Facebook? Um, it is actually called Shark Tank Entrepreneurs. I was on ah. Shark. <laughs> <laughs> I was on Shark Tank season five, but a gentleman, uh, Mark uh, Bergener, uh, he was on Shark Tank season one, and he started the group in an effort to just help pay it forward. And he's an inventor entrepreneur. He has a toy uh, called Cubits. And um, so he wanted to help other people um, learn how to get a patent and, um, you know, just kind of pay it forward because he has a heart for helping fellow entrepreneurs too. Um, I was actually a member of the group before I got on the show. I was the first person to have been accepted into the group that actually made it on the show after. I think a few others have since. Um, but we're about 17,000 people right now, and we're just constantly giving free advice and information to other people. And there are experts on social media. There are experts in licensing. There are experts in all sorts that have that same passion for giving back. So. I'll, link to, I'll link to it on, in okay. the show notes. Fantastic. Okay, so going back to, to, to what you mentioned with regards to the mentor, did you who, who was your mentor initially? You know what, I actually had a few, um, and um, I was very fortunate that I maintained great relationships with my clients at General Mills um, from my NASCAR days, mm -hmm. and granted, they've never, the ones that I would ask advice from time to time, they were never in a position of launching a, a product, but if I had a question, like I'm filling out a new vendor form and I didn't know what something meant, they could help me out. Looking back, I wish I probably would have had a better mentor or a, not, not a better mentor, but just a, a mentor who probably had a little bit more experience in launching a brand. I really did read a lot of books, read a lot of internet articles. I did more of the learn as you go, and I would advise against that. Um, but at the same time, um, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the mentor that I preached to other people to have. So. Still, still, still uh, we'll learn from your mistakes if, if you're right. our mentor. Okay, before we wrap up, because I normally have what's called a lightning round where I ask a single question and you respond with a single answer. I'd like you to take us through the journey of how you got into Shark Tank. You said you're one of the 17,000 members, one of the few 17,000 members in, in your Facebook group, the Shark Tank Entrepreneurs Facebook group, I was actually made it. So it's quite an accolade. How did you do it? Uh, you know what? Uh, I was a reject for season four. I um, and they, I think forty to fifty thousand people apply for the show every year. Um, yeah, in the U.S., it's huge. So, um, and only a little bit over a hundred will air. So your chances are. I mean, I people are like, "How do you get on the show?" I said, "Don't plan on getting on the show because it's probably not going to happen. Focus on building your business, and if something happens, that's great." Uh, so, um, for season four, I did an email application 
And I felt like I got to maybe the second level in the casting process, but then I never heard back from them. For the next year, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go to one of the open casting calls. And so they had one in Atlanta, which is about four hours away. And I drove down to Atlanta, got in front of them, did my, I had one minute to pitch, and then they did some follow-up questions, and then it kind of started from there. So I think it really helped me that they saw me in person, saw my passion, and of course, I came with bigger numbers than the year before. So it was really a blessing that they held off a year for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just kind of evolved from there. So um, there is no way you just have to. <laughs> and I think there's luck involved. Yeah, because, luck, yeah. You know, I get randomly put in a line with one of six casting people. Had I got put in a different line, would it have gone that way? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Cool. And, and I suppose there's, there's been like a snowball effect from a media coverage standpoint, having been in Shark Tank, you'd have had a lot more inbound media media queries come, come, come your way. Uh, you know what? Um, I, think, I think a lot of people are interested in people who have been on the show because it is such a low chance for anybody to get on the show. Mm. Um, from a... The nice thing about Shark Tank here in the U.S. is that it's now syndicated on CNBC, uh, which is a a cable channel, but uh, we will get aired probably once every two months on CNBC. So it's not a huge viewership, but it's nice to kind of keep the brand out there. Obviously, we are restricted in using, um, like, Shark Tank on, you know, marketing and point of sale and packaging some people do they break their contracts i i don't um i personally i abide by my contracts um so i don't probably bend the rules that some people do and they might benefit more from it um but you know that's okay with me we are going to be a successful business whether we were on shark tank or not um some companies they really have to have that continual shark tank coverage update segments and things like that to kind of sustain their business and um but you know it's, it's a good thing slaughter yeah. actually you know markets itself it's the you know the product is strong enough to to um to to to, to sell itself there's a word of mouth you know element to it and just yeah. due to its taste really yeah okay are you ready for the lightning round i am i okay. I, I am <laughs> i'm gonna ask you four or five questions so okay what are your future plans uh launching a secondary line um, I don't have a date on that yet. Do I need to keep them shorter? That's oh, fine. You yeah, um, you know, I want to uh, I want to redefine what a relish is and uh, hopefully change the traditional thinking of, of a category um, that really hasn't changed in decades. So Fantastic. keep going. Okay, how do you hire people? Um, you know what? Um, how do I hire people? Um, Try to find people who have assets that you are weaker in. Um, I think it's very beneficial. Uh, And I have a lot of, um, like, brokers who are commission-based only sales reps um, kind of scattered throughout the U.S. So um, I think communication is a big thing for me with them. Um, I communicate, and I know they're busy with a ton of other accounts, but I try to communicate every month or two months with each one of them. Um, I think that if you don't keep a tight leash on some of those uh, commissionable um, sales reps, um, sometimes they can forget about you. So um, I I think you have to really be a great communicator when you're contracting out um, that kind of support. Okay, okay. What are your three indispensable tools for managing your business? Indispensable tools for managing. Um, I am a... (laughs) I'm a calendar person, um, if, and I'm a very type A person as well, so um, I'm always juggling a million different things at once, so I have to, if, if I'm thinking, I, I try to think ahead, I, I'm one of those people, I don't sleep at night, I will get up in the middle of the night and write stuff down, it, that's just, it's just crazy Julie, um, so I have to um, forecast ahead and project ahead uh, things I have to do and so I note those things on my calendar so I don't forget 
So I guess something as simple as a calendar is one of my indispensable tools. A digital one or a, or a physical a, one? A digital one, okay. yeah. So I get the pop-up reminders. Um, I mean, I guess I could do a physical one, but it'd probably be very messy. Um, let's see. Um, independent, uh, you know, I will tell you one thing. Um, some food manufacturers decide to manufacture on their own, um, and some will use a co-packer. Okay. And uh, there are positives and negatives on both. I utilize the co-packer. They're a level three SQF certified facility. They have been in business 40 years, no recalls. I mean, fantastic quality, um, quality control. Uh, it saves me from having to get out huge loans and invest great deals of money into building. And they are a huge asset for me that they can run production, you know, at will for me. Um, so they are a huge asset. Um, and let's see, a third. Um, I think just a really positive attitude. Um, I see it. Yeah, I mean, gosh, you just, I mean, it's tough, but I wake up every day and I'm energized. So I guess, and I don't even drink coffee. So oh. I guess one of those crazy, I'm one of those few Americans that don't drink giant coffee. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think it's just, I don't know, attitude, I guess. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, what has been your best mistake to date? By that, I mean a setback that's giving you the biggest feedback. Oh, let's see. Best mistake. Um, I think early on in my professional career, I was perhaps too trusting of perhaps other people who took advantage of that trust. Uh, or that um, generosity, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I paid financially for that. <laughs> um, so I think that really um, raw learning experience that I had, um, of, and I, you want to see the best in people, and you want to you know, help other people. Um, but I think now I see things, um, the other, I see the other side of the coin every time I'm at a decision-making step in the process. Um, so I kind of see the good and the bad, and I, you know, take that into account. Okay. That, make sense? that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> okay, so fine, final question. If you could choose a single book or resource that's made the highest impact on how you view building a business, which would it be? I'll tell you. Um, there are some very entertaining business books out there. Now, the book that I think is going to have the most impact on any food business is that one coming out by Random House. Um, hopefully, so I'll keep you posted. Which we on. talked about earlier before the call, before yeah. this call. So um, you're you're you you you're part. You're a co author in, in the book. Is is that right? Well, not not co author. We're going to be our story is going to be featured, featured. within chapter okay. within, okay. the, within the within a chapter. Okay. And it's kind of like a food bible. So okay. um, it's going to be a very beneficial to anyone starting up. Um, but I think I'm. I really enjoy, I don't have time to read, but I do enjoy Larry Wingate's books. Um, he is, oh gosh, um, he's a guy who is very bold in um, calling it like it is, uh, and I think if you have people on your team um, that maybe you need to give a little bit of a wake-up call to, or uh, I think it's really good to filter his book throughout your work community. Um, he's got several, um, you're broke because you want to be... Um, Gosh, what are, um, but basically they, they kind of, some people who are really bad employees might take offense to the book because he is really calling it like it is, but they are the, they are hilarious books. I, I think they're funny. I'll be sure to check yeah. them out because I haven't heard of the, the author yet. Okay. So we're, we're going to call it a wrap. We're, we're going to you know put a wrap around this, but is there any other thing you want to share with the, with the audience before you, you leave us? Gosh. Um, no, I think. In the U.S., uh, two out of every three new jobs are created by small business, um, and they are really the driver of our economy. So I say go out and support small business. A small business, I think most people just assume it's the restaurants and the brick-and-mortar stores and on Main Street USA or Main Street, wherever you're at, um, but they are service providers. They are people who have invented products that are on shelves of major retailers mm. um so um go out and support those small businesses that's just 
I 100% concur with you, <laughs> with that, with you on that. Okay, it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, Judy. Thank you so much for sharing your tips on launching a food brand, and best of luck with Slosser. Oh, thank you so much. I hope it helps. It certainly has, most certainly has. And you might, um, some questions might um, come down your way from the audience. Okay. What would yeah. the best way to, to get in touch if anybody wanted to, to get in touch with you? Uh, the best way is um, you can send an email to um, marketing at .com. Okay. Um, I will end up getting those or through our contact page. Um, I am on Twitter at Jules Boucher or at Slalsa. Okay. Um, so that's another way. Um, I personally am not on Twitter as much as I probably need to be. I'm usually on with my business. Or you can go to the Slalsa Facebook page and submit questions, you know, uh, through the message board on there and we'll get you answers fantastic it's been an absolute pleasure having you judy thank you so much okay bye now Ta.